as well, so then we can put it later on. Okay. On YouTube. Okay. Where do I find it on Facebook, Isaac? I'll send you. I'll send you a link later on. I think I send oh, you a link in one of the emails, but I'll send you later on. You know? Okay, great. Uh, so very well. So let, let, let's just start. So thank you uh, everybody for being here to this uh, another seminar on the seminar series of complex systems organized by the area of complex systems at Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana. Today we have a, a special uh, guest, and I'm I'm very excited that uh, you know Brian. Uh, you know, uh, replied, you know, very fast and, uh, you know, very rapidly agreeing to give a seminar. So I'm going to briefly introduce Brian for those who do not know him. Brian Keating is a, currently the Chancellor's Distinguished Professor at the University of California, San Diego, and the author of more, more than 200 scientific publications, two, two U.S. patents, and the best-selling memoir, Losing the Nobel Prize. Uh, Keating did uh, research at Case Western Reserve University, Brand University, Stanford, and Caltech. In 2007, he received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers from President Bush. Keating is a fellow of the American Physical Society and co-leads the Simon, Simons Array and Simons Observatory Cosmology projects in Chile. He's a pilot and an honorary lifetime member of the National Society of Black Physicists. He's also a fantastic uh, YouTuber, podcaster, a, uh, an excellent writer, and a scientific, a scientific communicator. So Brian, thank you very much for being here. Uh, please take it away. Well, it's an honor to be here, Isaac. Thank you so much. And everybody at the Universidad, it is quite a pleasure. We do a lot of uh, planning with, uh, with, with uh, a lot of our colleagues throughout the uh, Spanish speaking world. And my wife was trying to encourage me to give the talk in Spanish today, but I figure uh, I would spare you that. And I would talk about only things I can actually speak with some knowledge about. And that's some of the ex exciting work that we're doing to push back the frontiers of knowledge, not only in the specific instance of examining the early universe and how the early universe came to have the appearance that would later lead to what we see today, but also the fundamental nature of the laws of, of physics. And I think that that in some ways could even be more exciting in the way that I'll describe than even the uh, discussion that rightfully has captivated intellects and minds around the world, which is the prospects of perhaps measuring the aftershocks of inflation using the so-called B-mode polarization of the cosmic microwave background. So that's my day job. But my night job is, uh, is, is actually doing a lot of outreach. As Isaac mentioned, I have a bunch of books. And, uh, and if you're interested and uh, willing to, uh, to check out this book, I wrote recently from a distillation of the 10, nine interviews I've done so far, with Nobel Prize winning physicists, uh, ranging from Carl Wyman, who I think will come to speak at your university not too long from now, <clears throat> uh, as well as uh, Barry Barish and Ray Weiss and many others. So if you take your phone out and point it at the screen, it should take you to get that, uh, uh, where you can get more information about it. Hey, and but, uh, Brian, you, you have to share your screen. Just oh, I didn't share it, sorry, okay. It's all right, don't worry. There we go. You know, I've only been doing this for the last pandemic for the last 10 years. It last, feels like last 10 years, but. It's all right. <laughs> all right. Now tell me, Isaac, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Now it should be full screen, yes? Yeah, excellent. Oh, okay. So you could take out your phone. You could take a picture of the QR code in the right, and it should take you to Amazon later. But even more important than that is a lot of the outreach that I'm doing, trying to provide uh, insights into how do experimental cosmologists think about the universe and our place within it. So this book, Into the Impossible, is kind of a self-help guide uh, for people working in science and technology. And so I think it would be hopefully relevant to almost anybody, but in particular to scientists, young and old, that are trying to learn the important soft skills, the skills they don't really teach you in your classes about how to interact with collaborators and competitors and deal with criticism and even something called the imposter syndrome, uh, which Barry Barish was kind enough to write the forward to uh, in this book, winner of the 2017 Nobel Prize. And that really kicked me off in this adventure of wanting to distill the life lessons of these laureates in ways that anybody could understand, even if they're not a scientist. So there's there's no equations. There's some beautiful artwork that uh, an artist made for me 
uh, that you'll enjoy as well. Uh, the other thing I do a lot of, so here's some of the artwork from the laureates. That's Shelly Glashow on the left and uh, Ray Weiss on the right. Uh, very, very uh, amazing and different people, theorist, experimentalist, and very uh, different in kind of uh, information and advice. Uh, but sometimes there's a commonality as well. And I thought that that was a really wonderful benefit that I didn't expect from writing this book. The other thing I do is a YouTube channel. So here, you could, this is free. So the other one could cost you you know, um, uh, some serious uh, money. But this one is free and you can sign up by just, again, pointing your phone at the QR code on the right. And I'll take you to my channel, uh, Dr. Brian Keating on YouTube, where I do interviews with these Nobel Prize winners, as well as with billionaires and, and, uh, and authors and uh, neuroscientists and, and all sorts of, of people, generally from the sciences. Uh, today, I have on Dr. Sarah Rugheimer, who's speaking about looking for micro microscopic aliens throughout the universe in her research uh, at, at uh, Oxford. So uh, tune in. That'll be uh, about an hour after the seminar ends today. And uh, the, the you know, kind of other people you'll see on here, you might recognize some of these folks uh, ranging from Julian Barbour, Michio Kaku, and others. So I like to do a lot of outreach and bring people's uh, attention to things that they might not have thought about, such as why do certain coins have properties like ridges on them? Why does the universe uh, always seem to end in a in a uh, big rip versus a big crunch? Why why would we expect perhaps the universe to begin in a bounce instead of in a bang, et cetera, et cetera? So please check those out. I put out about one or two videos a week. Okay, but first we're going to talk today about the basics of experimental cosmology as practiced in the field of the cosmic microwave background. I'm sure you're familiar with the complexity of the universe as a dynamic system featuring all sorts of activities, uh, including gravity, including uh, dark energy, dark matter, and as well as the initial formation of the elements of which were comprised. And those have been spectacular successes in the CMB, cosmic microwave background has really revealed a tremendous amount of information. Uh, so far, there hasn't been very much information that has only been revealed by the polarization state of this ancient photon signal that we get. In other words, the polarization measurements that we've done with our collaborators and my projects have revealed great detail, but primarily it's been to confirm a lot of what we've known about the early universe, thanks to the spectacular success of the CMB temperature anisotropy measurements of projects like Planck and WMAP and South Pole Telescope and the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. So, but I'm gonna talk about things today primarily that can only be done with uh, the CMB's polarization. And to do that, we want to take a, take a step back and understand why are the stakes so high for this type of research? And it really would be even more, as I say, revolutionary than the measurement of the you know, formation of the elements, uh, for example, the leftover heap that is the CMB. It could be more revolutionary than even finding inflationary gravitational waves. And that would be to unravel our faith in the most deeply held of all physical phenomena, and that's called relativity. And it's not just a relativity of Einstein. Einstein actually got there second. This guy, Galileo, he got there first. So in the uh, early 19, uh, 16, uh, 1600s, Galileo first began an exploration of the laws of nature and their dependence on whether or not the experiment was done by a particular individual at a particular time in a particular place in a particular state of motion. And I call him a moral relativist because he really started off this concept that the universal laws of nature should not depend on who you are, where you are, uh, what time you're doing it, and when you are, et cetera, et cetera. They should be universal. And he did so in his famous book, The Dialogue and the Two Chief World Systems, uh, the first audiobook of which I am proud to announce uh, I have recorded in human history with my car colleague Carlo Rivelli and with a foreword by Jim Gates, uh, Frank Wilczek, and Fabiola Giannotti. And uh, this is a spectacular work of love that will hopefully come out in the next few months. It's an audiobook, first time ever 
translated for now into English. If you guys want to translate to Spanish, uh, I'm more than willing to, uh, to, to assist you in that project. But uh, the, this, this book changed the course of history, according to Einstein, more than almost any other book before or since. And I think it's just spectacular that the laws of relativity really undergird almost all we do in physics. And we take for granted that they hold true, that Galileo was a smart person and that this is accurate. However, we don't know for sure that these laws are sacrosanct, that they hold throughout the entirety of the universe at all times and all places. And so part of what I'm going to talk about today is how you could test the inviolability of the law of relativity, of so-called Lorentz invariance throughout the universe. And you could do so only with the CMB's polarization. So this is a unique killer application of CMB polarization, in addition to its B-mode polarization, which may or may not reveal the origin of the universe via inflation. Um, and I've often said inflation could have taken place, uh, but been too, uh, too weak, too low an energy scale to be detectable, in which case we could never prove nor falsify inflation. So that is a very interesting conundrum, whereas this type of science we can conclusively prove whether or not the universe or falsify whether the universe has a Lorentz invariance property associated with it. And I should say, you can just ask questions at any time. I, um, I won't monitor the, the chat, but if you wanna ask questions, please feel free to do so. So uh, for hundreds of years, this was held to be true. Um, in fact, it really wasn't appreciated that the so-called luminiferous ether, which makes its appearance in the laws of Maxwell uh, really was not well-founded. In other words, that the universe didn't need a, a medium through which electromagnetic waves and gravity and so forth could propagate. Uh, instead, they conducted what's called a null result experiment. This was actually done at my alma mater at Case Western Reserve University, or now it's known as that. Back then it was Case Institute of Technology in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And what they did on this famous interferometer, and it's amazing that interferometers have won so many Nobel Prizes. <laughs> uh, this, I think, was the first one uh, that uh, did win a Nobel Prize for an interferometer experiment. And we use these, obviously, uh, you know, throughout our undergraduate laboratories to do things like measure uh, the spectra of different, of different elements and, and properties of other, of other sources. But they were trying to see if there was an annual or semi-annual dependence of the speed of light due to the fact that along certain directions, the ether drift would add constructively to the velocity of, the, uh, of this apparatus on the Earth's surface. And other times it would add uh, destructively. And so you'd get a behavior depending on whether or not you measured in the spring or the, or the winter. And they found no such result. So it's the so-called null result. And this indicates that at least there was no preferred motion uh, reference frame, no zero point. And it's quite astonishing that this became the basis again for Einstein's relativity as well. So Einstein wasn't the first to invent relativity. He synthesized the ideas of Galileo uh, with those of uh, with those of of um, uh, uh, Galileo with the uh, null result shown here, and use that to construct his, of course, famous uh, laws of special relativity. But are we sure? Does this establish that there isn't even a preferred reference frame, maybe not in time, but in space? So if you think about this measurement here, this is, yes, it takes place over different times but it's really trying to demonstrate whether or not there is a, a vector, a preferred direction in space. This isn't really uh, demonstrating the time inviolability or invariance of the laws of physics. It wasn't meant to do that. Um, but, uh, but now the question is, in, in cosmology, time is a proper dimension. It has all the properties that you would expect from a, from a proper dimension. It's on the same status as, as space. And therefore, you might expect to find over extremely long time scales that the laws of physics could vary, and even the constants of nature could vary. And our job as physicists is to probe whether or not that's true. And so to do that, uh, I want to take a, an examination of some of the successes that I mentioned earlier uh, and how good these successes have been towards establishing the standard model of cosmology, so-called lambda CDM model, which posits that the universe is dominated by a dark energy with substantial amounts of dark matter. 
and that the largest force in the universe is one of gravitational collapse and rarefaction. And this is all done, you know, throughout the history of the CMB dating back to 1965 with Penzias and Wilson, all the way up through the WMAP uh, Planck results and, and so forth without any real, you know, uh, without any real tremendous revolution coming from CMB polarization. In other words, we found that the universe was flat acoustically uh, from the acoustic oscillation measurements of Toko, Maxima, and Boomerang shown in 2000 and 2001. And then, uh, and then we refined the maps with WMAP, et cetera, and Planck. But nothing truly revolutionary has come from polarization. I say that as the, one of the key people who proposed the first BICEP experiment, the first uh, measurement ever to go after the B-mode polarization, which could come from the quantum fluctuations depicted here in the earliest epoch of the universe known as inflation. But again, we don't know that inflation took place. We have very strong consistency that the uh, properties of the universe behave as if there was an early quantum superluminal expansion of space-time endowing it with properties that we later would observe in the structure uh, formation. But it's not really the existence proof for a time equals zero event. We don't really have a, a, a definitive measurement or even a paradigm of how inflation fits in to the cosmic genesis event, if that even took place. So we understand everything after the first few minutes of the universe's evolution, but the question is first few minutes of what? After what? What was that event? And that leads us into questions of quantum gravity and, and so forth that I won't talk about today, but I've had many, many conversations on my podcast, Into the Impossible, on audio and Dr. Brian Keating on YouTube, where I've discussed the question of whether or not we really truly have a motivation to find a quantum theory of gravity. And that typically comes in through a discussion of whether or not the universal laws of nature um, have to have uh, at their core a uh, dispensation, if you will, for these singularities and other phenomena where quantum uh, effects are manifest. So I see there's something in the chat. The problem with Zoom is that I can't access that chat. <laughs> uh, don't, don't worry, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm checking the chat. If there is some question, I'll ask you. So um, if you had microwave vision and you went to the Atacama Desert in Northern Chile, uh, you would see currently uh, four major telescopes uh, located at the site of which will eventually become the Simons Observatory. These are the Simons Array telescopes. These have been here for five years measuring the CMB polarization. And the first order signal or the zeroth order signal is the monopole, which has about 2.7 degree Kelvin equivalent black body temperature. If you remove that average temperature, you see the famous anisotropy signal to, owing to fluctuations, primarily in the amount of dark matter creating potential wells that then accrete ordinary luminous matter, which then oscillate and produce these about one degree scale fluctuations on the microwave sky. And the question is, can we remove the uh, temperature as well and get down to the true polarization signal? And if you can, you can hope to resolve it into two different components, both of which have been detected, uh, although uh, not from the uh, second source listed below. We have seen E-mode polarization, which traces the exact same physics and phenomena that the temperature fluctuations trace. We've seen B-mode polarization, though not from gravitational wave sources shown on the left. Instead, we've seen it from what's called gravitational lensing, and that will merit a complete other talk at some other time. Uh, but the primordial gravitational wave signal has not been observed, and that is the goal of upcoming and current experiments like the Simons Observatory. Of course, there was a claim back in 2014, which I wrote about in my book, Losing the Nobel Prize, and that claim uh, since evaporated into a uh, equivalent measurement of the amount of dust in the universe. But recently, these signals have been updated by the BICEP team uh, to go extremely low in terms of the characteristic signal or parameter called the tensor to scalar ratio. Um, and that made a big headline, as I said, ripples from the Big Bang. Um, and in fact, just this month, we published, or the team published rather, a constraint of the tensor to scalar ratio, little lowercase r, 
at the 3% level, 3.6% level. So this is phenomenally, uh, this is about 100 times lower than I thought would ever be measured uh, when I designed BICEP-1 back in 2001. Uh, and so this measurement that we're talking about here, uh, a necessity has arisen to go push this even lower, and that drives us to really only to build more and more of these telescopes. So BICEP is upgraded to BICEP array, and the Simons Observatory will have three dedicated telescopes doing this as well. Now, of course, what was the under, undoing of the BICEP-2 experiment? It was dust. I talk about that in my book, as you see at the top, losing the Nobel Prize. So that was the end of the line for that measurement. And so we want to be humble, as Gandhi advised us to seek uh, truth. We must uh, humble ourselves and go after dust as well. So I'm not going to talk about the B-mode polarization signal. Again, that's a whole talk on its own. Instead, I'm going to talk about something called cosmic birefringence and how we're going to go after that with the Simons Observatory. So our ordinary optical birefringence is, is somewhat familiar, showing that calcite crystal on the left. It literally means double refraction. It was uh, first discovered in the 1600s, not long after Galileo's first telescopic explorations. And it means that for an unpolarized source, like that line of ink that says, uh, you know, or the text that says calcite, that's unpolarized. Equal amounts of vertical and horizontal polarization will transmit through, and they'll come out at two different uh, angles. Um, I'll skip over the actual laws behind it, uh, but suffice to say that if the universe possessed a Lorentz symmetry violating term, in other words, it broke the tenets of the invariance under boosts and rotations and positional translations, that we could detect that. And we have tight limits on that, but there are limits that actually have been claimed recently that could be claimed under or other circumstances as detections. And I'm going to talk about that primarily in a minute. So Lorentz symmetry underlies all of our knowledge of physics, of the standard model of quantum mechanics, particle physics, and general relativity. And so if you had a tiny little shift in it, you might see, due to that breakage of symmetry, you might see down the line effects that you can measure in both electromagnetism and in astrophysics. But the effects in electromagnetism are far too weak to measure in the laboratory. And so therefore, we have to go to much, much longer baselines to measure potential effects and allow them to accrue to measurable levels. So one such principle is, is that we believe that all the laws of physics are unified, or if we at least believe that the, um, that the grand unification of electromagnetism with, uh, with the weak force holds true, and even if we only believe in electroweak unification, and my past guest Shelley Glashow and, uh, and Weinberg and Salam, even if we only believe that the electroweak force is unified, uh, you might start to think that electricity and magnetism should display some parity violation. And the reason is the following. We know that there's an abundance of different parity violating effects in the universe. We know it actually from our bodies to chemical molecules, all the way up to, uh, uh, up to the uh, origin of life and how that may depend on the handedness of chiral molecules. But we also know it at the atomic scale and the nuclear scale since the 1950s. When, uh, when T.D. Lee, C.N. Yang, and C.S. Wu did a series of papers and theory and experiment uh, to determine that the mirror universe is not the same as our, 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 as our ordinary universe. That looking at the uh, nuclei in a reverse sense, cobalt-60 spinning in a mirror, we don't see the behavior that one would expect the rotational properties of the cobalt nucleus in, as viewed in a mirror shown on the right, they shoot off these uh, positrons, beta ray, electrons rather, be, uh, uh, beta rays. They are shot off, not according to, uh, to, the, um, to the direction of the, that the nucleus is spinning, because if she, uh, CS Wu reverse the direction of the spin, they still shot off in this direction, uh, pointing down here. And that owes itself to the breaking a maximal level of violation of parity via neutrinos. We know that neutrinos only are, are ordinary neutrinos are only left-handed. And that is an extreme violation. You'd expect them to be equal amounts of left and right-handed, but we never see that. Um, and so because of that, we say the weak force violates symmetry, violates parity. 
And because of that, we could say if the electroweak force is the unification of the weak force with electricity and magnetism, then perhaps at some level, the electromagnetic force could violate parity as well. And we know this is a small effect. So I point out in a video I did recently that, you know, Madame Wu, uh, she lost the Nobel Prize, but she did get a stamp named after her. Uh, and that's, you know, small consolation, but at least she got that. Um, and so uh, we want to look for this effect of so-called cosmic parity uh, rotation or cosmic polarization rotation. We want to do that. It's called CPR, abbreviated CPR. And it actually comes down to the person who's the benefactor of our experiment, the Simons Observatory, Jim Simons, who uh, in a mathematical context invented, co-invented this uh, mathematical topological invariant, which when applied to electromagnetism, if you add what's called a chern simons lagrangian term to the ordinary Maxwell uh, Lagrangian shown at the upper left, you get new laws of dispersion for uh, left and right circular polariz polarized light. And that will indeed result in a parity violating signature, which could be measured in the universe. So this is the way it would behave. You'd have a source on the left oscillating light wave, the electromagnetic field, and it would be oscillating vertically up and down. And then as it traversed through the universe, shown here, it would rotate a slight amount. Here it's shown an extreme amount, 45 degrees, uh, by the time it emerged at your telescope. And it's just like this calcite crystal shown below, that the universe could exhibit a non-zero vacuum dispersion between vertical and horizontal polarized light. And that would be astounding because it would point to a preferred direction in space-time, namely the time-like direction. It would say that the time-like direction is not symmetric. If you then send this light backwards, it also rotates. And so uh, you'd have a violation, or you'd have a direction of time, you'd have a direction, preferred orientation direction on the sky, and that would perform, point to a preferred reference frame as well. So the, all those things would violate Lorentz invariance symmetry. So that would be astounding. So it behooves for us to look for it. And actually, even if we found it, it would be the second or third time we found it. Uh, but most recently, uh, it was claimed to be detected, as I put in the abstract of this talk. Uh, it was actually claimed uh, to be detected first back in the 90s, uh, and then only recently, uh, just this past about a year ago in October 2020, it was again claimed the evidence for an additional term in the electromagnetic Lagrangian. And sometimes this goes as uh, uh, with the name of the axion, which uh, could or could not be the same uh, uh, you know, hypothesized field that's responsible for CP violation in the strong nuclear force in QCD. Uh, that has not been detected either. And it should be noted that that is actually a uh, candidate for the dark matter particle, which cosmologists have been searching for literally since the 1930s, uh, with Zwicky first coming up with this concept of dark matter, and Vera Rubin's work in the 70s and 80s establishing it once and for all, that it is real and it exists. And yet, we don't have a particle candidate for it. All the limits to date or just that, just upper limits. So not only could this field called the axion be responsible potentially for the dark matter observations that we do see, but it could also be responsible for a rotation of polarization indicative of, shown on the right, this preferred direction, namely this time-like direction in the universe, which otherwise is forbidden in Lorentz symmetry. So Galileo would have had to change his, his, uh, his laws to say that, well, if you're doing an electromagnetic experiment, it does matter when you do the experiment, because if you wait longer, you'll get a different result than if you wait a shorter period of time. And that's fundamentally uh, uh, anathema to a Lorentz symmetric phenomenon. So just to kind of um, set the stage for these axion-like particles, there's a wonderful site um, on GitHub that I put a link to there. Uh, and this shows all these different limits. There are a lot of limits on a so-called axion-like particle. And most of these are coming from dark matter experiments. Some are coming from radio um, telescopes. Some on the far left are theoretical um, constraints from black hole spin 
uh, from LIGO Virgo observations. On the right, you have some limits from the supernova 1987A uh, that do set a limit. And then we hope to set a limit on these axion-like particles because they will modulate the polarization orientation of cosmic microwave background photons, which are the oldest light in the universe. Therefore, they probe the longest baselines in time. And because of that, we hope to use them as sources, uh, or if you will, of uh, potentially constraining not only the B mode polarization from inflation, if inflation took place, but also of Lorentz violating physics and potentially of axion physics. And these are things that can only be done with the CMB's polarization. So that is a fascinating um, uh, prospect that one of my students, Jake Spizak, is working on. And uh, we hopefully will have some results in the near future from projects like BICEP, as well as from the Simons Observatory and the Simons Array. So let's go back uh, and just take a quick look at this uh, really fundamental paper by Sean Carroll, um, uh, who published this, actually was on Galileo's uh, birthday in uh, 1990. Uh, and they published this churn simons effect. As I said earlier, they come up with a uh, additional Lagrangian term that leads to rotation. And here, uh, and so that paper was cited by uh, this paper by Ichiro Komatsu and uh, Yuto Mayanmi in 2020, using data from the Planck experiment in order to constrain the amount of polarization rotation that could be attributed to something called quintessence, which would be a new form of energy, which would evolve over time, kind of like an evolving cosmological constant. I know that's a contradiction. A uh, dark energy, if it varied in time, then you have a variation in the time-like coordinate that would cause a uniform rotation of every photon's polarization plane all over the sky um, throughout all time. And depending on how far back you look, you'd see different amounts of rotation. So it got a lot of attention. Here are all these websites I found. It was in Nature uh, discussed. Now, this is only uh, you know about a two sigma result, uh, a little bit more than two sigma. So it's not, you know, really at the level of you know going to Stockholm just yet, but it would be quite fascinating in order to get more and more data. We do need to both validate and replicate the claims by Kamatsu and Mianmi, but we also have to go deeper. We need to reduce the error bar on this beta term, what they call beta is the amount of rotation shown in the upper right of each photons polarization as it propagates from the surface of last scattering 400,000 years after the Big Bang to our telescopes today. So that's what we're looking for. And as I said, this is not a new claim uh, to be made. The universe has been claimed many times to have a birefringent behavior, and every time it's been refuted. So once back in the 90s, when I was in graduate school, we saw this in the lower right. The universe may have a direction after all. So there you see, see two different axes of uh, observation and radio waves from two different galaxies, one from galaxy A, one from galaxy B. And they, because they're at different angles, like that calcite crystal, they would show a different amount of rotation for each detected radio wave. So this was quickly refuted by uh, Sean Carroll, as it turns out, uh, only a few months later, uh, they uh, found that the two authors had made a significant mathematical conceptual error, not understanding the uh, properties of polarization, that you never really can know the absolute direction of an electromagnetic wave oscillation plane. You can only know it's plane. So uh, they confused and they had this twofold degeneracy between a light wave polarized at zero degrees and a light wave polarized at 180 degrees. And they average those together and they got a whole excess of stuff at 90 degrees. But of course, zero and 180 are the same to a radio astronomer uh, looking at polarization. So it was actually a completely erroneous signal. Nevertheless, it was on the front page of the New York Times. And I remember uh, getting excited about it. Then in uh, the 2000s, uh, data using my experiment, BICEP, as well as other experiments, also made a, a three sigma detection claim of this cosmic polarization, this churn simons like term. Uh, this was never retracted, although we did publish a refutation of it some years later, but it's very difficult to do these measurements because unlike measuring the temperature of the CMB, you can calibrate an absolute measurement 
You can calibrate the CMB's temperature, absolutely, using a source on Earth, effectively transferring that to astronomical sources of temperature, like Jupiter, which we've sent spacecraft to and we've plunged thermometers inside of. So we know what, exactly what their physical temperatures are. And we can convert that to an absolute antenna temperature that we measure here on Earth or Planck in space. And therefore, you can absolutely calibrate them. You can't calibrate polarization. There's no standard stick for polarization. There's no standard piece of, uh, uh, of spaghetti that tells you exactly how much polarized energy you're seeing. It just doesn't exist. So you have to make it yourself and you have to be very careful combining results. So as I said, this recent result claims 2.4 sigma detection, which always sounds better in percent, 99.2%. Uh, of course, it's less than half of what you'd like to make a claim this astonishing that the universe does care about who you are, where you are, and when you are. Um, so, and they don't make a claim that that's definitive detection. They just say, you know, it's a hint at something, it's interesting, and it deserves more uh, study. So that's exactly what we plan to do. So uh, here's a compilation that one of my uh, former students published, uh, just of all the measurements that have ever been done of this cosmic polarization rotation angle, CPR angle, along with their uh, statistical errors, plus the systematic errors, included in uh, where indicated, but many of these don't have systematic errors. Systematic error is another way of calling for calibration. The only way to get rid of a systematic measurement is with another measurement, AKA a calibration. So uh, they claim that they're, they've calibrated this um, using Planck's pipeline and some measurements of foregrounds uh, that's not universally really accepted, but, um, but if you do take them at their word, as they say on the right, on the left rather, they say if confirming, it would be a game-changing discovery. So we, we do believe that that is accurate. So where do we go from here? We wanna measure the temperature and polarization of all the photons that come to us and then look for departures from parity symmetry, both for looking for gravitational wave potentiality, but also for Lorentz invariance violation. So to do that, we're building many experiments, but we're building in particular the Simons Observatory, which is a $100 million observatory that I co-lead with colleagues at UPenn, Princeton, and Berkeley, as well as uh, 300 of the most brilliant scientists around the world uh, at 40 different institutions on all seven continents, including Antarctica. So what is the Simons Observatory? Well, we've got a flashy, cool logo there of our large telescope. It's a combination of four telescopes. On the Atacama Desert, in the foreground, you see the Simons, Observat Simons Array. In the foreground, those three telescopes pointing more or less towards you. In the back right, you see the Atacama Cosmology Telescope's ground screen that shields out the warm 300 Kelvin emission from the volcano that we're sitting on. They tell us it's dormant. I guess you guys know a lot about volcanoes down there in Mexico City. Uh, so never trust that it's completely dormant. That's my only advice. And then the left, you see the class experiment that's led from Johns Hopkins. In the background, you see the uh, Atacama salt flats, uh, lagoons. It's a beautiful environment. And it's just a lovely place, it's a tourist destination. And here we're depicting it, it's 5,200 meters above sea level. So it's quite high. Here's me and Adrian Lee and David Spurgle, Jim and Marilyn Simons. And we're digging, uh, uh, making groundbreaking here. And we did that in July of 2019, over two years ago. And today we're pouring concrete and building structures and we're all doing it by ourselves. We don't have any help from the government of America or Chile. Uh, it's really done private funding with our colleagues and collaborators. So the science goals are to measure primordial B modes and also clusters of galaxies and look for E modes. We have a two-fold approach. We have the large telescopes. I already showed you those. Here's the team. The most important aspect of any collaboration uh, is the team. And this is our last in-person meeting in July of 2019 up at UC Berkeley. Uh, we've had two remote ones. It's only virtual meetings since then with all these folks online. And uh, we hope to have another uh, meeting this summer in San Diego in person. So it's in this location. It's not far from Alma, which is the one of the world's biggest and most uh, costly experiments um, at 16, uh, 50, uh, 5,100 meters or so elevation. Here's from, actually, this is over a year old. We're pouring a platform here. This just shows you what you have to do. <clears throat> concrete does not like cold weather. And so you have to pour this concrete 
mix it, uh, make sure it's perfect, it has no bubbles. You pour it on this steel frame. We had to design and build all of this. These aren't our team. We have contractors that actually pour it, but then you have to put a tent over it and heat the tent for a week to make sure the concrete actually cures. Um, so this is you know about as complex a system as we have to deal with, unlike what you guys deal with. But um, it's a challenge. It's a really big challenge to build things at 5,200 meter elevation in the winter, summer, day or night, getting people up the mountain, getting diesel fuel up the mountain, dealing with challenging weather conditions. This is late spring uh, in this, uh, when this video was taken. So you can see it still snows in the spring. You see the guys are wearing um, uh, oxygen tanks on their backs, uh, construction equipment, heavy boots. It's a dangerous environment. Safety is a huge concern. Um, and we're building this world that's gonna be the world's highest uh, uh, observatory ever built. We have a twofold strategy, as I said. We have a, an array of three small aperture telescopes, primarily designed to measure the B-mode signal from primordial gravitational waves. We are keenly attuned to uh, Gandhi's advice to not overlook dust. So to do a dust removal means that we have to measure dust only and then subtract the dust only signal from the CMB plus dust signal. And we do that with a six frequency spectrum of detector sensitivity, ranging from 27 to 270 gigahertz. So from centimeter wavelength to millimeter wavelength, it's a, actually a huge span. And each uh, one of these detector systems is outfitted to do just that. They're also put inside their own ground screen to shield from the uh, warm uh, ambient emission. We're looking for signals that are only a few parts per billion above the ground temperature, even at a chilly cold place like the Atacama Desert. So one of the three receivers is in my laboratory here in San Diego. Here's my team uh, working on this, uh, installing it, putting it together. It's a massive, huge scientific apparatus uh, with uh, 10,000 detectors in each cryostat cooled down to 0.1 Kelvin using uh, helium-3 which is uh, an exotic isotope. Uh, it's actually a regulated uh, commodity. The aperture is almost a half a meter in diameter, and it's uh, made of uh, a very high transmission dielectrics that have to be unpolarized. It's a real serious engineering feat. Uh, detectors designed by Suzanne Staggs at Princeton University and her team built at NIST and uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator uh, Facility. Uh, so this is big science. These are going to be, each one of these will have almost the sum total of all detectors ever built in the CMB since Penzias and Wilson. So it's a very complicated cryogenic vacuum electronic and, uh, and systematics challenge to build these detectors. So we are planning to deploy next year, about one year from now, we're going to start observations with the first uh, of these three telescopes and uh, rapidly followed by calibration and, uh, and observations with the other two telescopes covering these six frequency bands. We also have a large telescope that can measure signals down at arc minute scales. And that's led by Mark Devlin and, uh, and collaborators at the University of Pennsylvania. I won't talk about that. That's another talk. You could invite Mark to talk about what the Large Aperture Telescope will do for cosmological cluster measurements, for measuring neutrino masses, for measuring exotic neutrino species, perhaps sterile neutrinos. There's a, a rumor going around that tomorrow there's going to be a big announcement from the Mini Boon collaboration about uh, something pertinent to sterile neutrinos. Uh, if so, that could be corroborated or measured by instruments like the Simons Observatory Large Aperture Telescopes. So it's just another way of seeing fundamental physics, the properties of particles, forces, fields, and philosophy, things like Lorentz symmetry, and testing that using exclusively CMB polarization. It's just an amazing time to be doing experimental cosmology. But the name of the game is to build, um, is to build highly sensitive instruments that have low systematic contamination. So how do we do that? Well, again, we have this notion uh, of great interest in all these measurements shown there going back to the 80s. Um, so the key point is that if your polarization detectors are slightly miscalibrated, 
you will interpret an E mode signal on the upper uh, set of panels. Uh, you will interpret it slightly as a spurious B mode signal. And again, the B mode signal is what indicates the, um, the presence of primordial gravitational waves. And the correlation of the E modes with the B modes indicates the presence of, of a, um, indicates the presence of a possible Lorentz violation. And so therefore you have to be exquisitely careful that you're not uh, misinterpreting uh, the, the signal to uh, cosmic origin when it really comes from your instrument. And so that's a process of calibration to remove systematic errors. Um, and uh, we wrote several papers about how to do this theoretically, but we could also do it experimentally by building very accurate polarization calibrators. So there's one at the top that I helped to install at BICEP. It's a little fuzzy. That's at the South Pole, Antarctica, where BICEP is located. On the lower left, we might use radio telescopes like the Very Large Array in New Mexico <coughs> to measure uh, properties of astrophysical objects, such as the uh, Crab Nebula, also known as Taurus A, which is a polarized source, but it varies with time. It varies with frequency. It has a, uh, a dependence on, um, on, on position. It is not as accurate a polarization calibrator as say Jupiter is a temperature anisotropy calibrator. So it's easier to get rid of um, systematic effects in temperature, plus the signal for temperature sources is much bigger. At least if our signals were bigger than the temperature, the temperature signals are, are detected in an hour or so with each detector. The polarization signals may never be detected. They're so small. And so uh, you'd like there to be a better calibration source. So collaborators in uh, Chile at Pontifica University have developed and gotten funding for a drone calibrator, which is really cool, but it's very challenging to fly a drone in the thin atmosphere at 5,200 meters. So Rolanda Donaire and others have worked on this. It's schematically shown lightweight. It has to be lightweight to fit on a commercial drone with uh, just propellers to give it lift. Flies over the Simons Observatory, shines in a polarized source, modulates the polarized source so you can reference it and phase sensitively detect it. And then you can measure the signal. And he's done that uh, on the Atacama telescope first. And then later he's going to be working on this with funding he just got um, from, from Chile to build this for the Simons Observatory. And uh, so it's a, it is very much a success-oriented um, uh, international collaboration. So here's one of uh, uh, Federico Nati, who's a collaborator. He's just putting the finishing touches on the drone, and now it's going to take off and fly um, and fly over the uh, the uh, fly over the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, obviously very much sped up, shining in polarized light. Then the telescope you can see moving back and forth, scanning it. And so they've been able to reconstruct polarization angles exquisitely accurately. And we think variations on this method and others can now allow us to do it in all six of our frequency bands uh, to a level of precision never done before to get rid of any instrumental effects that could limit our measurement ability. So what is next? Well, again, we're trying to look for this ancillary signal uh, that was first thought to be, you know, really unimportant or what have you. But now we believe it could be crucial because now it could reveal the underlying laws of physics need to be revisited. Um, so it's received a lot of attention over the years. It's kind of rising like a like the amount of carbon in the atmosphere or something like that. Um, but the question is, you know, where can we go from here? And there's too little time left. I want to take questions. Uh, but there's too little time to talk about all the other cool stuff we're going to do at the Simons Observatory related to the fundamental properties of our universe, including the origin of magnetism and, uh, and how that reveals itself via the CMB's polarization. Again, that would be a talk for another time. So I want to say, close with a quote uh, from a very wise man who passed away just a few months ago, Steven Weinberg. He said, physics thrives on crises on crisis. And he said uh, later after that, he said, well, luckily, you know, physics is short on crisis. <laughs> but today we have a lot of them. Well, we need to understand, you know, these things like the Hubble tension. We want to look at this claim of cosmic biorefringence. We want to understand the uh, essence of dark energy. 
We don't know what dark matter is made of. We don't know what dark energy is made of. We want to understand if our laws of nature are sacred. And so there's a lot of crises in cosmology. You can see all these uh, different quotes where people are arguing and saying that it is crisis, it isn't crisis. <laughs> um, I think it's funny. I think it would be great uh, if only Steven Weinberg could see it uh, when we actually can resolve some of these things. And uh, hopefully he'll be looking down from heaven and uh, even though he didn't believe in heaven as far as I know, but he will be, <laughs> he will be pleased with the abundance of crises and how that is spurring physicists to do more. So once again, if you're interested in, um, that's actually no longer 99 cents. I did make it 99 cents the first week it was out. If you do want to pick up a copy, I would love to hear what you thought of it. Um, and uh, when I come and visit you guys, I will sign each and every copy. And then the other thing is, as I said, please do uh, scan this with your phone and uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel because I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, all the cosmic adventures that I go on with my brilliant guests. So thank you very much. I want to take some questions now. Uh, thank you, Brian, very much for this very interesting talk. And thank you very much for, uh, you know, uh, for being here with us. And, uh, and again, uh, you know, I would I have your, your, your book here. Okay, it's a fantastic book. I, I would highly recommend it. So we have uh, time for questions. Uh, so if some of the colleagues here have a question, please unmute the microphone and ask directly. I also myself have a couple of, a couple of questions. Uh, Hugo Morales has a question, please. Hugo, go ahead. Oh, um, hi. Um, thank you very much for a very nice talk. And I, I would like to, to know your uh, your own view about uh, the relation between possible a possible theory of quantum gravity in this possible violation of parity or Lorentz symmetry, if, if yeah. you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mentioned that very, very briefly. Um, and I think, you know, to say a lot would, would, would kind of take us into uh, a different territory, but I showed this slide here. So if we do believe in a, um, uh, you know, fundamental unification, of general relativity and quantum mechanics. So the standard model SM here is this, you know, theory of 17, you know, fundamental elementary particles, mediators and, and force carrying and mass carrying objects. We, that's predicated on quantum field theory and the notion of quantum field theory taking place in locally, at least in locally flat space time, uh, unless you are very close to either the Big Bang or to uh, a black hole singularity. And yet um, we know that we cannot yet unify them. And the question is, are, if they are unified, um, you have to either finely tune the, uh, the violations of, of uh, CPT violation or CP violation and P violation. You would have to finely tune them, for example, to have the electroweak force only exhibit um, this parity symmetry violation and not electricity, um, that means you have to suppress the violation in the electromagnetic sector. So what does that? I don't know, uh, but it could be some other you know, field or some other interaction with some scalar field or something like that. There is another kind of notion, which is that um, leaving aside black holes, which we can never observe the singularity anyway, um, there are many who say that we don't um, need a singularity, at least in the universe's origin, or, or rather that when you find a singularity, it's not a, a true singularity. It's a mathematical or you know, the coordinate singularity. And it really should be interpreted as the breakdown of our classical laws and classical intuition. And if you could get away from that, in other words, if you could have a theory that doesn't have a big bang, um, and doesn't have a singularity, then, uh, then perhaps you don't need to unify quantum mechanics and gravity anyway. <laughs> so for all these reasons, I think the symmetry breaking that underpins both GR and uh, quantum mechanics, I think you know, finding a departure from that in any of the sectors uh, would be revolutionary. And I think that would have to be accommodated by any you know, theory of quantum mechanics uh, that incorporates gravity or in any theory of gravity that incorporates quantum mechanics. Uh, Thank you. More questions, Hugo? Yeah, just uh, complementing this, sure. uh, this question here. Uh, in regarding this uh, 
um, use of the Chern Simons approach to the to the observations. Uh, uh, would it be possible to relate the the amount of uh, this uh, effect with the Planck scale somehow in, in what you uh, in, in your view? Ah, well, um, I don't I don't think necessarily it would come down to the Planck scale. Um, I think this effect would be operative later on, you know, long after the Planck scale. So it's a, I mean, here it's manifest as a uh, addition to classical electromagnetism. So this is at much, much lower energies. And so we, if it did happen, I think it's a good question, but the CMB kind of erases all information about the universe electromagnetically before 380,000 years after the Big Bang because of the scattering events and last scattering, um, the, the photon trajectories and even their polarization states uh, can get modified. And therefore you can't use light to learn about the symmetry itself earlier than this time. Now that's fine for measuring Lorentz violation or this cosmic polarization rotation, because it doesn't really matter to us if we can go back um, the extra 380,000 years to time equals zero, if that exists. Um, so for the purposes of, C, of CP violation or, or P violation in the CMB, indicative of some Lorentz violation, I think that it does not matter. Now, the other way, though, that one could expect to observe what you're claiming uh, or what you're, what you're interested in is uh, using gravity. Because if there is a grand unified uh, force or grand unified theory. And if there's a theory of everything that incorporates not only the nuclear and electromagnetic forces, but gravity as well, then it could be that gravity is also parity violated. And there are uh, theories by uh, Lee Smolin, Stefan Alexander and others uh, that seem to say that if there is a theory of everything, you could indeed observe what, exactly what you're asking, but you'd need to observe gravitational waves to do it. Now, how could you observe gravitational waves from the Planck era? There's only one way we think we can do that, and that's using the CMB's B-mode polarization. Uh -huh. So from the electromagnetic sector, you'd get EB correlation terms. And from the gravitational sector, you'd get a, a, a different term that could be indicative of chiral gravitational waves. In other words, that one wave propagates at the speed of light, uh, one polarization state, and the other one doesn't. And that would lead to a rotation of the plane of gravity wave polarization. So yes, I think it's a it's it's a prospect, um, not not directly envisioned from uh, these measurements I talked about today, but certainly not not too far from it. Thank you. More questions? Somebody raised their hand. Uh, I think it, it was Hugo. Let me check if there is another. Uh, uh, no, it is Hugo who read ask. I I want to ask uh, one question, and actually. <laughs> My question, okay, I have to tell you that I'm very, very, very amateur uh, cosmologist. Uh, actually, thanks to you following your uh, YouTube channel and all the fantastic videos you, you have. And uh, I wanted to ask you something about the, the choice of model. So I, I think that, the, as you mentioned very well, the, the measurement part is extremely difficult and yeah, you are overcoming a ma major obstacle. But also, uh, for instance, if I look at the at the work uh, that uh, recently have done uh, Subir, Subir Sarkar about the existence of dark energy or not, it seems like the choice of model or, or assuming a, a certain model, for instance, Lambda CDM, might I don't know how to say this, it might skew the the interpretation of the of the experiments. So, what is the situation in your case? Is the choice of the model? Uh, does the choice of the model uh, could predict, uh, you know, violation of a Lorentz invariant? But if you choose a different model, for instance, a bouncing model, uh, you can uh, you, you can uh, interpret the, the measurements without a Lorentz invariance. Um, I don't I don't think it depends on the origin of space time necessarily, um, at least for the primary subject of today's talk. I think I think that is agnostic about that. Um, for the gravitational wave component that I just mentioned, it is very, well, in practice, it would depend on whether or not there was a bounce versus a bang. And I have a video about that in my YouTube channel. But the, the essence of whether or not we can measure the gravitational waves at all, because we're, you still need a source of gravitational waves themselves, 
And that, by the way, to answer the previous question, or get back to the previous, so the Planck epoch occurs about, um, let me put it this way, inflation occurs at, I think, about a million Planck times. So it's not really a quantum gravity um, you know, uh, phenomenon. The inflaton field is a quantum field theory um, phenomenon, but the actual um, tracer or epoch is not during... Uh, I don't think it can take place at all. It's kind of in the classical regime compared to the Planck time. So to, to actually measure the chirality of gravitational waves would depend on whether or not there is inflation. And therefore, if inflation takes place, you don't have a bounce. And I think those are incompatible. So sort of, Isaac, I, I, think, I think you could rule it out um, or it would come into play, but not on a philosophical sense, in a practical sense, because you couldn't measure the chiral gravity waves without there being gravity waves and gravity waves are only produced by inflation. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, more questions, colleagues? If not, I think uh, Brian, you have to go because you have to, uh, you have to go to your YouTube channel, right? Uh, <laughs> no, I have to teach now. Uh, <laughs> ah, you have to teach. Okay. One more hour, one more hour to go to the YouTube video. Uh, okay, so if there are no more questions, I don't think there are more questions. So shall we thank the Brian for this fantastic seminar? Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, guys. Gracias, gracias. And next time, uh, we challenge you uh, to give the seminar in Spanish. Ah, <laughs> okay. That'll be that'll be interesting for everybody. <laughs> Bye, guys. It was really a pleasure. I do hope to meet you guys in person someday. Yeah, yeah. We, guys uh, and gals. Yeah. <laughs> the same for uh, the, the same from us here. Okay. Take Thank care. You. Thank and, uh, you so much. Bye, Isaac. Thank you for organizing. Bye-bye. Thank you.